It was a calm day on the Johnsons' beach when Mark's mother yelled from the back porch. Mark, someone just called saying spring skiing is on. I didn't know you were going skiing. Mark Johnson and Dennis Schreiber stared at each other blankly, only moments later realizing what was going on. Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band were coming to Colgate. Mark and Dennis were the leaders of the social committee during the 1975-76 school year, putting them in charge of planning non-Greek social events, mostly concerts. By the spring of 1976, Mark and Dennis had been booking musical acts for four years. You started out as grunt labor and you worked your way to the top, Johnson said. By the end of your four years, you knew the contracts, the companies, etc. Mark was notified of the possibility of bringing Springsteen by the committee's booking agent, Harris Goldberg, on March 25, 1976, the Thursday before Colgate's spring break. When Springsteen was confirmed, the pair acted quickly. We were like lightning, Johnson said. We'd get tickets, we quickly designed a poster. We got it to a company in Utica to print them. At the end of the week, we had half a dozen guys plastering posters all over campus. Springsteen's advance team also said the glass and star wink had to go, so he paid for that and got all that taken down within the week. Mark Johnson and Dennis Schreiber were, were just uh, geniuses. I mean, they knew how to find talent and get them to come to Colgate. So, why is the system for bringing musical acts outside of Greek life so complex and different now? The answer to this question seems to lie in a perfect storm of events in the early 1980s, resulting in the slow mutilation of the social committee, and the end of premier musical acts at Colgate. In late October of 1981, the social committee brought the group Atlanta Rhythm Section to perform on campus. Unfortunately, the Atlanta Rhythm Section performed only a small portion of their set, frustrating not only those in attendance, but the administrators, who would put $8,000 into the concert. That fall, the Student Association, comprised of students and administrators, voted to reduce the social committee's budget per year by $8,000. Immediately, the Maroon mourned the days of Bob Marley and Bruce Springsteen at Colgate, and members of the committee saw the end of their popularity and success at Colgate. The budget cut was damaging first because it meant the committee could not bring as popular acts as before, but also because it significantly reduced the group's freedom to plan, organize, and choose their own events. Without the monetary power to react quickly to the chaotic world of live music, the committee was severely handicapped. The committee suffered another blow in the summer of 1984 with the National Minimum Drinking Age Act, which brought the drinking age from 18 to 21. The Student Association decided to, quote, restructure the social committee and thereby look to organize low-cost activities for the campus that didn't involve alcohol. In the fall of 1984, the social committee's function was officially altered to plan activities in response to the rise in the drinking age, as reported in the Maroon News. Alcohol had served two major purposes for the group increasing ticket sales, and tying the concerts to the favorite social activity of Colgate students, drinking. With this gone, the group became disconnected and alienated from the Colgate students, resulting in a significant decrease in interest by potential new members. As time passed, the Student Association sought to ensure they used their money, quote, the right way for the right things. They slowly disassembled the social committee into many different subcommittees, and the actual social committee merely functioned as a formal budget distribution group, executing decisions made by the Student Association. Once the committee was broken into so many subgroups, it became plagued by high rates of turnover, inconsistency in taste and philosophy, and a generally low level of commitment. Ultimately, various decisions by the administration, as well as restrictions in the budget and changes in national law, led to the destruction of the social committee by stripping away the things that made it great. 